Thank you. Uh, and thank you again to our musicians. That was uh, wonderful. I know you all felt exactly the same way, so uh, thank you for that. And, you know, today was a really special day. We had a couple of uh, significant moments today. Uh, Jordan's baptism and Samantha's dedication. We're very happy and excited about that. And, you know, as I was reflecting on this scripture uh, this week, uh, in light of these events, in light of these milestones, because what we've seen today in both cases is in some sense the beginning of a Christian life, right? Each in their own way, each in their own level. And so today I think that this scripture challenges us to ask the question of now what? Now what? Because just prior to what Wayne read this morning, Matthew has just recounted Peter's famous confession of faith in Jesus. Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, responds, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So with this confession of faith, Peter has entered into the first most basic phase of the Christian experience. Peter is officially a Christian. He believes that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ. That makes him a Christian, right? In the most basic sense. So it's no surprise then to pay attention to what Matthew says next. Because after this confession of faith, Peter says, you are the Christ. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and to undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. You see, Jesus is now showing them exactly what it means to be a Christ, to be the Messiah, to be Christ. You say, okay, you believe that I'm the Messiah? Well, then here's what that really looks like. It involves suffering and death. But Peter, as we just saw, is not okay with this, right? So he pulls Jesus aside privately to rebuke him. He says, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. And I know I've made this point many times before, but how often are we in our own lives like Peter in this situation? How often do we reject the idea that suffering is a part of God's plan for us? I see it in my conversations with people all the time, and I addressed it just a few weeks ago. It felt like last week, but that's because I've been gone. But you remember you know, three or four weeks ago, we were talking about spiritual maturity and Paul with his suffering, but he recognizes God gave this to me that I might find strength in my weakness. But we still have this tendency to be spiritually immature, to be spiritually unprepared for loss or difficulty. So what's Jesus' response to Peter? It's very surprising, very interesting. After Peter says, no, 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 this could never happen to you, Jesus responds by saying, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Now, why is this so surprising? Because Peter here is being the optimist. Peter is the one that, from an outside perspective, looks like the one who really has faith in this situation. Because it's Peter who says, God forbid, you must never suffer. You must never fall on difficult times. Peter must have been thinking to himself, Jesus, you're righteous. And we know that God blesses the righteous. God will always take care of you. Everything will be okay because God will take care of you. You see how what Peter is expressing is a kind of faith. So how surprising is it then that Jesus responds to him by saying, Peter, you're thinking about human things, not divine things. You're looking at things from a human perspective, 
not a divine perspective. Why? Why? Because Peter is thinking short term. Peter is measuring success according to his own human standard. So for you in your life today, maybe you have recently lost your job. Maybe a loved one is experiencing serious illness or a relationship is falling apart. And our instinct, perhaps what we think is our best instinct, our instinct of faith is to turn to God and say, God, fix it. God, fix my problems. God, make these problems go away. And we think that by doing this, that we're exercising faith but perhaps we're setting our mind on human things. Perhaps we are limiting God, and we want God to work within our plan rather than submitting ourselves to God's plan. Of course, when we go through painful experiences, we pour out our hearts to God, and we tell God what we want. And even Jesus himself does this, so don't mistake my meaning. I'm not saying don't take to God your wants and your needs and your desires. But the lesson that we see from Jesus is that even when he expresses his own desires, our prayer must always be his prayer, which is not my will, but yours be done. Having opened up our hearts to God, our prayer must be this. God, what would you have me do? God, what would you have me learn? God, how can I, through this situation, become more like you? God, how can, through this situation, you be most glorified? Now, it may be, it may be that God will be glorified by you getting a better job than you had before. And we hear those stories, and people come up in front of the church and they give their testimony about how they went through what they thought was a difficult time, but it turned out, in fact, to just be an opportunity for something better. Or God may be glorified in providing a miraculous healing for your loved one. But we must also be aware that God's glory may come through the witness of your patience. Your faithfulness through hardship, your sense of peace through pain, may be God's greatest purpose. We have to be open to that. Now, it's interesting that Jesus says to Peter, get behind me. Get behind me, because I think there's a kind of double meaning here. On the one hand, it means get out of my way, right? And of course this makes sense because he refers to him as a stumbling block, something that obstructs your path. So Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, don't get in the way of what God is doing. But for Jesus to say, get behind me, carries with it a double meaning because it also foreshadows that Peter, along with the rest of the disciples, must follow in Jesus' footsteps. Get behind me and follow me. This path towards the cross is not just for Jesus. This is the destiny of anyone and everyone who wants to be a disciple of Christ. Anyone who wants to say that Jesus is the Son of the living God, that Jesus is the Christ, He's now unpacking for us what that means, and it means to follow the way of the cross. Now, I want to pause here very deliberately and say that if you've been zoning out up to this point for whatever reason, it's been a long day, I'm asking for your attention because what Jesus had just said here is the clearest most basic and most essential idea in the whole Bible, yet somehow it has become the one that is most misunderstood. Now, as Adventists, uh, we have this tendency to uh, pride ourselves on going against the mainstream. You know what I'm talking about, right? 
that everybody else got this thing wrong, but we read the Bible for its plain word. We see what it really says, right? You know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? But what we're talking about right here is, in my opinion, the most prevalent of deceptions, the most problematic, the most, perhaps even the most harmful error in the history of Christianity. I've heard it in every denomination. We've sung it in so many songs. We've studied it in the Sabbath school quarterly. We've shared it with our neighbors. We've been told since the time that we were children that this is the good news of the gospel. But for that very reason, I can't help but think that this is one of the devil's most successful deceptions. Do you want to know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the lie is this, that Jesus suffered and died on the cross so that you don't have to. Nowhere, nowhere does the Bible teach this. And as we just read, Jesus makes it perfectly clear that to be a disciple of Jesus means to take up our own cross and be crucified with him. And this is the consistent message from Jesus, from Peter and James and John and Paul. Christianity is an invitation to suffering. And when we see Jesus on the cross, as you've heard me say before, when we see Jesus on the cross, we don't see what could have been us. Oh, thank God that he took my place and suffered so that I don't have to. No, when we look at Jesus on the cross, we don't see what could have been us. We see an example that we are called to imitate. We are seeing what we ought to be. Now, Peter himself learned this lesson. You see, because in this conversation, Peter doesn't get it. Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. Peter says, no, 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 that can't be. But as we know later in life, Peter comes to understand this truth. And I can't help but think that when Peter writes his first letter, that we now have in our Bibles as First Peter, I can't help but think that this interaction with Jesus was in his mind as he told the church these words. First Peter chapter 2, Peter says, It is a credit for you if being aware of God, in other words, having your mind on divine things, just like Jesus said, right? It's a credit for you if being aware of God, you endure pain, while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called. Now pay attention. Peter says to the church, to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you, what, an example, so that you should follow in his steps. You see, the suffering of Christ is for us an example that we should follow in his steps. He goes on to say, he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. You see, Jesus does not say that some of his disciples must take up their cross. He does not say that taking up the cross is a possibility that you have to be aware of. Jesus says it is a necessity. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Now, fortunately for us, Jesus unpacks a little bit further what this means and what this looks like. He says, For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their soul? Or what will they give in return for their soul? In other words, to find true life, to find eternal life, 
we have to learn to let go of the lives that we have. To take up your cross means to live every day with this attitude of self-sacrifice, to live not for yourself, but for the glory of God. And isn't this exactly what Paul means when he tells the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore what? Therefore I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Paul is one who has let go of his own self-interest. He's not driven by a desire for success. He's not driven by a desire for happiness in the ordinary sense. He lived each day not for himself, but for the glory of God, because he had the big picture in mind. He understood that any happiness, any success in this life is nothing compared to a life with God. So what does he do? He says he pours out his life like a drink offering. You, ju you can just picture that image of someone just taking a full cup of wine and just pouring it out as an offering. He says, that's what I do with my life. I pour my life out. He lives his life with a radical and reckless love. Paul here is someone who lost his life for the sake of Christ, but in so doing, he found it. And this is exactly what he describes to the Philippians. He says, whatever gains I had, I've come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as a loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, but I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Now, is that true of you? You want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Well, what does he say? And the sharing of his sufferings. By becoming like him in his death, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You see, Paul is so consumed, so overwhelmed with his love for Christ, that everything he has accumulated, every possession, every achievement is considered worthless compared with knowing Christ. And so the thing in life, and this is, this is just the most surprising part of the New Testament, and, and it, it explains why we've lost sight of this message, because it is difficult to understand. It's difficult to swallow. But Paul here expresses that the one thing in his life that he cherishes the most is his own suffering. Why? Because he knows that it is through that suffering that he's being drawn closer to Christ. And that it is through that suffering that he is being made more like him. So if we take up our cross and follow him, we will also be raised with him. As Paul writes to Timothy, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. And so Jesus finishes his conversation with Peter by holding out this same hope. He says, the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. And we know that Christ will come to reward those who are faithful to him. Those whom Christ has honored with the crown of martyrdom will be crowned on the last day with eternal life. Now, God may or may not call you to take up a literal cross, to go and be executed for his sake. But we cannot dismiss that possibility. Right now, even today, all around the world, there are people who lose their lives for being followers of Jesus. But even if that is not your fate, that's not for you to decide. Your responsibility here and now today, and every morning that you wake up, 
is to think of the cross. And when you see the cross in your mind, when you're reminded of what Christ has done for you, you pledge yourself as an offering. You pour out your own life, letting go of the achievements and the possessions and the desires of your own heart. You let go of those things And as Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. Let's pray. Father God, we are in awe of the sacrifice of your Son and the love that you have shown to us through his mercy, through his compassion. But we pray today that as we join ourselves to him, as we become members of the body of Christ, that we too would be sanctified by your Holy Spirit, that our lives, our bodies, may be acceptable to you as a sacrifice. God, there are difficult things in our life that we have a hard time letting go of, things that we're afraid of, but we need your Spirit to carry us through so that if we can let go of our lives, we can find ourselves in you. We thank you for your love. We pray for your continued guidance and blessing. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Well, I invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, a hymn that I think begins to grasp this idea of clinging to the cross, clinging to the cross, the old rugged cross. So, after... Paul says, present your bodies as living sacrifices. He gives these instructions, and I just want to leave you with these words. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, but be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering and persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. You may be seated.